The following program may contain coarse language, suggested dialogue, and discussion of violent imagery and sexual situations. It is intended for mature listeners who can tell the difference between facts and opinions. Hi, this is TV's Jay Hickman, and you're listening to a Toonami Faithful Podcast exclusive. Welcome to NAMI Faithful Podcast listeners. This is editorial uh, writer and I guess now editor-in-chief CJ Maffer, alongside the founder, Paul Pasquillo, here with a very special guest here today. Hello, hello, everybody. I'm Jay Hickman, uh, the voice of Jirichiro Yukihira from uh, Food Wars and a few other shows of note. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us. This is a real treat and a real pleasure. <laughs> oh, the pleasure is mine. Thank you, guys. Uh, since you mentioned uh, Joichiro in Food Wars, I think we should start there. I'm very curious on your impressions of the show when Sentai first announced they acquired the license for it and that they were yeah. dubbing the series, considering how very uh, off the wall it can be. Yeah, no doubt. I, you know, to be to be candid, and and this sort of this sort of plays into my experience as a as a voice actor for. Um, for anime in you know for english speaking markets is that i did not know um of the show before sentai approached me so um and it's it's not for um you know being closed off to uh to other anime i you know i have an awareness of certain shows that come along and others uh, they can they can catch me off guard. So when I was first approached, um, it was actually by uh, the director Kyle Jones, whose name you might know, <laughs> very um, familiar, who um, who let me know that he was uh, working on something new. He he didn't at the time um, tell me in so many words that like this is kind of big. Um, but I could, I could sense that it was something exciting, just sort of the way he was, he was um, framing it for me. And so he let me know, um, you know, in so many words, it was going to be a cooking theme show and that in his exact words were, uh, you'll play the cool dad. <laughs> um, and so I didn't know much more about it until I got into the booth. And, and uh, the way I learned about it then was very similar to how, it usually goes um, when I'm introduced to a new show that I'm about to voice for um, was that, you know, there's, there's a few minutes of downtime before, you know, I actually put the headphones on and, and Kyle is sort of walking me through. So like, all right, here's the show. Here's what it's about. Um, and I'll be out in the kind of, you know, the main kind of control room with him. And so he'll have some of the show up on the monitors and he'll show me a little bit of this. Certainly, he'll show me what the character looks like, character design, so I can get a sense of of him kind of there in real time before I get in the booth. And so he, it, it sort of all unfolded piece by piece, little by little, where I was, it was slowly dawning on me the real kind of essence of the show. And so he did not, um, in the first introduction, kind of brace me for anything. Um and so uh, that, you know, that created its own kind of special um, kind of meandering discovery for me about, you know, <laughs> what, what the show was really, really, really about. Because Joichiro, as you all may know, does not have foodgasms. He's way too cool for that. <laughs> so I did not, I was not in a scene where um, people's, uh, clothes were exploding uh or anything like that for a while like that took a while so most of it was just like you know in episode one is where we started and joichiro and soma are at the family diner and they're cooking fried rice and he's ordering soma around and you know we're kind of getting a sense for their dynamic um and so it wasn't until much later that um i got to see the entire first episode and what was uh, kind of where they were willing to go with it. Um, and it was hilarious. Um, 
what was ever so slightly less hilarious was that when I received the uh, a copy of the DVD when the uh, season one was done, I gathered the whole family around. I'm like, check this out. Oh no, this will be so much fun. <laughs> You're gonna, it's one of my best characters. You're gonna love it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the first food gasm came on, and my daughter, who is like, you know, a young teenager, was like, Dad. Um, and I was like, all right, guys, time for bed. Um, <laughs> so we, we, um, we watched something else, uh, the next night, but, um, I'll, I'll ease them back into it. Cause it, that's, that's obviously the whole show is not all about, all about that. There's actually some, uh, some plot arc and some narrative and some character development there. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was a semi hilarious, um, kind of entree to, oh, so this is what they wanted to do. But I, I, I realized, you know, I I didn't need to watch too many more episodes to realize that like that is not, they're, they're not going to go to that well every single time. Um, and indeed, you know, kind of, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but enjoying season two now on Toonami, the way they do that is different than they did in season one, for sure. I think it's, uh, they've kind of, toned it down a bit it's still it's still definitely um it, it definitely grabs you and uh you know the idea of of people's clothes exploding when they eat something is um you know a bit of a departure from the mainstream but it wasn't quite uh quite done in the same way as it seemed like they were doing in the early episodes of season one yeah, and you can definitely notice instead of just making it clothes exploding, they would add references to it, like uh, the JoJo reference that we got in season two, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, at least just you know something different. Uh, I'm curious, at least since you become such a fan, obviously of the title, as the more you've been working on it, how do you how did you feel when something that isn't necessarily synonymous with Toonami, like it's not necessarily your prototypical shonen or action show? How did you feel that this was getting a chance to shine on the block and, you know, give everyone their just desserts? Ah, nice, uh, nicely framed. Um, <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. And I guess, you know, it, it is, um, th there is some elements of, of shonen to it. Like it wasn't, a, a, you know, a, a ridiculous departure from um, kind of the, the genre that seems to uh, do well on the tsunami block. But um yeah, I was just um I was just excited uh period that it was going to be given a shot and I, you know, for from the small role that I play in it, you know, I definitely felt like it had it had the chops and you all have, you know, bared witness uh, as much as anyone to how it's been received. I think there's you know, it's been um it seems to be get, you know, getting a lot of really positive feedback and at the same time there are people who are even now like what is this <laughs> um not not exactly sure what to do with it but i have seen you know i have seen lots of commentary online about people who um were quite unsure about it uh at, at you know first glance and seem to start to be won over and i i think that kind of um that kind of mirrors a little bit you know my first reaction when i first saw the full full episode one i was like whoa holy moly and you know you, you watch a few episodes and you'll you'll get it like there is some depth to it and and you do kind of th these characters are developed and the story is is developed in a way that you are invested um you, know, you do start to become invested and you know the the stuff that seems like um you know the flashy bits and sparklers and fireworks like that's enjoyable it's titillating um, and it doesn't, it doesn't make you think like, oh, that's, they're just going for flash. Um, it's, you know, there, there's some, there's both steak and sizzle mm -hmm. in the show, I think. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I see it too. Like, I feel like season one particularly was really magical. Like it really, it went, I want to say to like 11, but still saying kind of not necessarily like faithful to the manga. Cause like, that's just how you kind of see with a lot of anime, but it really seemed to depict a lot of the strengths of the manga Food Wars really well. And I'm curious if you kind of picked up or were able to notice through uh, your watching, whether it be on Toonami or DVDs or things like that, if you kind of 
we're able to see why this uh, title became as popular as it as it has. I think, um, yeah, I mean, from from my perspective, um, I, I guess I was experiencing in for many, you know, in many cases in real time with with everyone else who was watching it, because um, I did not binge the uh, the first season as soon as I received a copy of it. I did because um, I, I came to learn pretty soon that it was going to be on Toonami oh, and okay. and waited until it was on there to start kind of ingesting it one episode at a time, like many other people uh, prefer to do. And so um, I was kind of in real time with with many other uh, audience members kind of watching it as it evolved. And to your to your point, I think magical is is a, is a great word. And I, I think to watch, you know, Soma's journey um, and maybe, you know, maybe I had a little special perspective there because I'm uh, based on my character. I'm really rooting for the kid. Um, uh, but, um, you know, w- watching um, sort of the his experience, his tribulation, and kind of, you know, having his eyes opened um, as he kind of is sort of thrust into this world and starts to realize, um, A, that he's pretty great, and B, that there's lots of people around whom are also pretty great. Um, And so it's fun to watch his, I think the balance is really, really nicely done, where whereby we get to see him have confidence in himself, have that confidence grow, realize that he's learning and getting better, and in turn his confidence grows, but also to have these, um, you know, these little uh, sort of obstacles thrown at him or these surprises, like where he meets somebody else and he hasn't, you know, he's just, he's never seen anything like it. Um, Akira is a great example Mm -hmm. during, you know, the Curry episode right? uh, where he's like at the end, like, yeah, the, all the stuff you just did, I've never heard of half of it. I can't do that, but I'm going to, um, and so, you know, you get to see a little bit of rare humility from Soma. Uh, and then obviously the episodes where Jirichiro shows up, um, there, there's a whole different dynamic to how, how Soma behaves when his dad's around. But uh, yeah, so fun, fun dynamic to it in terms of the performances and the story arc um, and, you know, getting to meet you, you do get to meet and, and really fall for um pretty much all the other characters like I, it is, they're, they're all likable in their way and they all seem to fit fit their role so well they you know in terms of the, how they serve the story um there's just no there's no scraps uh, <laughs> in, in as much to say like it's it's just it's all brought together in a just beautiful beautiful dish and more on the relationship between soma and his father i don't really see many animes where the father figure actually is like a good father figure and some might argue well Jirochiro just drops Soma off you know kind of like a lion does with their cubs but you really do see uh, what a what a good father figure really means to Soma to be able to to venture forth at Totsuki and I'm curious if you kind of picked up on it if you feel that there's an importance to have like a actual uh, representation of a father figure that's actually like halfway decent compared to like what you see in other anime. Yeah, I guess um you know I get uh you may or may not be surprised to learn. I've played a few dads in my day. Um so I do I do get cast to play uh play fathers and they, you know, I I wouldn't be able to list them off for you right now but they have definitely run the run the gamut um <laughs> in terms of the sorts of fathers they are. And I, I, I don't really recall any that are um, neglectful per se, but um, it does seem like there's more than a handful that are just kind of oblivious um, and, you know, don't, don't serve the story as much as just for you to know that this protagonist has a father. And, um, you know, usually it's going to be, the the parent serves as an obstacle or so and so's grounded or whatever so that you know it's a something they've got to get around um but yeah joichiro was definitely different um and 
you know, watching, watching him and his relationship was also an evolution of sorts. And I think that is, you know, it's the, the creators of the show that kind of decided to sprinkle that out piece by piece, just, you know, exactly what he was up to. Um, and in the first episode, he just announces he's taken off and someone was like, what, what, um, it was like, I've got to take care of some business or something. And, you know, you, you later find out that the business, it seems was very likely going to Totski and kind of putting the wheels in motion to get some an invitation or, you know, set it up so that someone could go for the preliminaries or tryouts or whatever or transfer. And so, um, that's unknown to Soma and, um, Soma obviously bristles at the idea that he needs to go to a cooking academy in the first place. Like that's made very clear. Um, and it doesn't take long for him to get there and realize like, wow, there's, there's some stuff I can learn here. And so it, in a, you know, in a benevolent way, it seems like Juichiro is kind of pulling the strings behind the scenes. Like he knows exactly what Soma needs to grow and wants to, to nudge him in that direction. Um, just without being overt and I um maybe because he knows that Soma would react poorly if you know he was completely transparent. But you know, you get uh in the middle of the season when he comes back to visit the dorm and um the dorm mother is is giving him some business and um she's like, why don't you stick around? I'm sure your son would enjoy having you around and Juichu is like, I'm not really a hands-on kind of a parent. And she's like, that's BS. Like, you know exactly what you're doing. Um, and you knew that this visit and this food battle would be just exactly what Soma needs to kind of nudge him onto the next level and get him thinking about what's next for him. And sure enough, that seems to play out. So, um, it takes a while. Uh, I think as you watch kind of Joichiro's interactions with, with so many others at Totski, kind of just what is he up to? But, um, with each reveal, it seems like he knows exactly what he was doing. He knows exactly what he's doing and it's all for the benefit of Soma. Uh, de- de- it definitely feels that way. And that's kind of what made at least him, I think, more memorable for a lot of fans. I mean, besides his looks, cause he is a looker, but, yeah, uh, I, I do think a lot of people kind of gravitate when they think of like anime parents to him because while he may seem kind of hands off, he does kind of, you know, he's there for his son, which, which is all he could really ask for when it comes to a parent. Yeah. Uh, but I yeah, am curious, sure. uh, like when it comes to that kind of relationship where you're able to kind of pull from your experience as a, as a father. Uh, I suppose it's, um, you know, obviously, uh, Juichiro is a is a very different uh, different type of dad than I am. His uh, kind of actual family dynamic is quite a bit different. Um, I'm uh, I feel quite fortunate to have uh, my wife and the mother of my children still very much in the picture. Um, and it may you know Soma's story might might have been less interesting if uh, if his mom were still around and they were still a you know classic nuclear family. Who knows? Um, the fact that she's not, I think obviously, you know, uh, contributes a lot to who he is and, and the, the strength of his, um, relationship with his father, because there are not two parents in the picture, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, two, uh, I haven't sent any of my, um, teenage kids off to boarding school. So, <laughs> you know, I've got to live with them. Um, and, uh, so we, we have to learn to, uh, to deal with each other in close quarters, um, but, uh, for sure, I, I think, you know, it, it, as an, as an actor and particularly as a voice actor, when, you know, you've got to convey so much of, of what the character is feeling or thinking simply through your, your voice and, and kind of, you know, emotive qualities, um, you know, there, there are moments where you, you do pull, you want to pull from kind of real life to the extent that you can as you inhabit a character and you, you want to kind of lend it something um, real and genuine uh, for sure. You know, if there's moments with uh, Joichiro and Soma where there's an actual kind of connection being made, I think in episode one of season one where he like pounds Soma on the chest, he's like, listen, man, you know, 
you gotta you gotta go you gotta go out there and and make something of yourself do something um and so you know you 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 do i think try to pull from kind of you know what that feels like uh to, to have a a heart to heart like that with a child um to you know inspire them to kind of push them out of their comfort zone because you know that it's time for them to grow in that way. That's awesome. Uh, I will say probably the thing that I've noticed, and I'm sure Paul would could could attest to this too. I think the biggest thing that I really enjoyed about the addition to Food Wars 2 Toonami is how not only were there a ton of you know fans on the outside who were pumped for it, there are a ton of fans that are you know your colleagues like voice actors, whether they're in the project or not, that were just so ecstatic to be to see it on Toonami. Like I know. From uh, previous interviews that we've done, KG Tang was like, he loves Food Wars. He loves it. He even <laughs> loves your character the most. You know? Oh, wow. Like, yeah. It's just, it's one of those, and like, I'm sure, like I say, Paul could tell you, like, it seemed like a lot of people, whether they be, you know, just regular fans like him or I, to also people within the industry that were like, yes, it's about time. <laughs> uh, well, that, that's obviously extremely heartening um, to know um, I, I think anything you, anytime you can be a part of creating something, you know, you genuinely hope that it will be a entertaining, b not terrible, but c uh, meaningful to somebody. I mean, that, that's that's the greatest thing you could you could shoot for, is that you can create something that really resonates with somebody or um, something they can they can connect with, and and I'm. You know, I'm never, it never ceases to amaze me and just humble me so much when I get to meet people um, that have seen stuff I've been in and they will approach me and they will tell me that they, I don't know, saw the show for the first time last year and they couldn't believe it and it was amazing or whatever, or another show that they, you know, grew up with, it was 10 years ago and how much of an impact it had on them and how, how they related to it. And, um, you know, it was there for, for some people in some shows, it was their comfort food as it were. It's a place where they could feel, you know, that they have this, uh, escape and that was that thing for them. And it, um, it, it meant a lot to them and to know that, you know, they then drew a connection to certain characters and by extension to the people that, that helped create those characters, Oh, uh, there's there's a little more gratifying than that. So you know, to know that there's a show like this one that is resonating on a level like that, and and being received um, by people, especially industry folks, who are like, you know, finally, um, what a great thing to hear, man. <laughs> but no, I I could tell you, I'm like Paul has all the has all the data when it comes at least like people tweeting and stuff like that when it comes to us. I mean, I'm sure he saw a ton of people like, like whether they'd be fans or industry saying this is awesome. But, well, it, it was one of the, it was one of the top requested shows at one point. Yeah. So. And I know, let's, and I know for a fact, this has become one of Paul's favorites too. Yes, it has. Uh -huh. well, let's let's keep it going. <laughs> yep. so, well, hey, I mean, see, season three is coming soon, at least for uh, the home me media part of it. So, I mean, yes, we're rolling. Yeah, finger fingers crossed that that means what we hope it all means <laughs> right. for, for the exactly. future tsunami. Yeah, I I will before we kind of finish it off with at least food wars. I I do want to know: has there been any dish that you've seen that you want to make and eat? Because there are like a hundred for me. I, yeah. I don't know if Paul feels the same way with late night snacks and whatnot watching it, but there are so many times where I'm like, I want to make this. Yeah, vir virtually every one. I mean, I, I think that, um, and that this is no surprise to anyone, I'm like everyone else who watches this show and just cannot believe how good they make it look. Um, the animation is great. And I've, you know, I've, um, I know that the creators of the show really, really did their homework. And that I believe it's true. You guys might know better than I that, you know, every single recipe you see on there 
or every dish you see, you can find a recipe somewhere to actually make that thing. It's it, not like it's funny. Yeah, the author, um, as from from our manga expert that we have, he says that the author has a food specialist to be able to make sure everything, whether like the science of it is correct, things yeah. along those lines. And in yeah. the, in the manga, they'll have certain recipes at at the end of the book. So depending on what dish might be like the big thing, they'll have the recipe in it. I've screenshot a couple. I'm like, I can't wait to try these. Yeah, that is. Um, so it's that way for me. I guess there there are some things that seem like uh, somewhere in season one, they make beef bourguignon. I'm like, I've had beef bourguignon before. It was probably not as amazing as Soma's was. <laughs> but if I were to attempt to make it, it would be as good as anything I've already had Um rather unlikely to be better than anything i've already had so the, the, i guess i'm i'm drawn more to those things that i've never seen before mm -hmm. or just seem so remarkable or you know something the the ingredients of which they describe as being um kind of rare or novel or like you know the thing that the secret ingredient of this dish is whatever xyz root from uh you know from mauritania um and I'm be like, oh, now that's uh, that's something I've never tried. I guess the the very first dish that I was drawn to is in um, surprise surprise episode one. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it's the the bacon loaf, right? Thing like that. Um, the way they drew it, animated it, and then Soma's description of how it all came together and became something amazing, uh, and it actually looks doable like um that seems it you know it's not uh it's not just making jello for sure like there's going to be some work to it but you actually do believe <laughs> watching soma do it that you could maybe pull that off um so that's definitely something i'd like to give a try oh i hope you uh tweet that out at least to show all the fans that'd be really cool it's a promise it's a promise <laughs> Uh, and one one other thing, I do want to say, like my favorite aspect, what drew me to Food Wars were the stare downs. Like most, like the most notable that resonated with me was when Soma first uh, had a show Kugeki against Alice. I, I when I read it, their stare downs, like it was like the dangerous cat meets the like uh, kind of wounded dog that th knows that they have the upper hand. Kind of, it was amazing the the artistry with it. I'm not sure if Paul's favorite part is the food gasms when it comes to the show. Maybe I, I don't. I don't necessarily know for sure. But what would I, you... I would say no to that. But oh, okay. What What is your favorite part? <laughs> just Just so I get it right. Um, I mean, I would say probably just how just them like just whoever's like one of one of the the main characters winning uh, basically it's kind of how i yeah, go through it uh, basically or how i would say more like how soma like just makes everybody look bad <laughs> uh, yeah. so i'm curious jay what's your like favorite kind of aspect whether it be like the animation the music the food gas like what would you say is your like top thing when you come to watch food wars yeah great question i think um that it's tough because there's so many is so many different kind of disparate elements to the show and the way they're all woven together is is almost completely seamless like i think we, as we've already discussed the the food gather the food gasms do sort of shock you out of complacency like you might be um you know I, I, like when you're kind of you know ingesting any sort of media and you know you're drawn into the story you really want to be drawn into a story and everything else around you kind of dissolves uh, dissolves away and you're like part of the story you're in it and if there's something that brings you out of the story you become very aware of that and i think sometimes the foodgasms do depending on who's in the room with you i obviously i'm sure you've seen there are countless tweets about like i was you know just uh innocently watching food wars episode eight and then all of a sudden and my mom was like what in the world is that and i'm like oh no um <laughs> And so, you know, obviously people, if, if the, if the crowd watching with you was, uh, not just right, you would, you know, be embarrassed by like, you know, glancing around like, uh Oh, who else is watching this? But, um, I think, you know, I, I really enjoy, there's, um, there's some really fun comedic elements of the story. Um, but you know, that's, that's that's kind of all the way on this one end of the spectrum of, of what makes the show great. I think, 
um i think you know the fact that there is some some kind of um kind of shocking element to it the food gasm stuff is is certainly not unwelcome like i i think it it definitely it definitely serves uh serves its purpose uh the stare down part i and i do like the you know the time they take as we kind of alluded before like the creator of the show really went to some trouble to make sure that um you would you would so admire these people because they were making something amazing and doing it in a way that you know us mere mortals at home could never do and they had really gone to the trouble to make sure that they're not just um throwing you know fairy dust and fiction at it it's like this is this is real like there are chefs out there who can really make this who can really have an impact um on someone like someone who tastes it is truly transported to another place and you feel that you feel that as you're watching it um and so again for us mere mortals it, it's important for them to have those little vignettes where someone is giving some exposition and explaining like here's what makes this dish amazing like here's why your clothes are exploding right now um and I, I always, i'm always um I'm wary of of exposition in shows like it, it can very frequently be, be too heavy handed. And I, I never feel that, that way here. I think it's always done um, so well because they, they obviously give lots of different people a turn to um, to do the explaining. Like, here's what you're seeing right now. And, you know, so, sometimes in the um, in the fall selection uh, battles uh, or competitions, sometimes it's comedically done. Like the the judges, depending on who the judges are, they yeah. might take a turn at saying like, um, you know, he uh, he used chanterelle mushrooms. Well, you know what makes them special. Um, and, and so, you know, depending on who does it, it can be kind of funny, but. Um, Usually, I, I really enjoy that part of it as well, because uh, you know you're learning something, mm -hmm. but you don't realize it at the time. It's too entertaining. <laughs> it's, it's it's certainly enter entertaining and wild. Um, yeah, and and we could like like as you can tell, we could talk about food wars or all day. But I do want to kind of segue into kind of an important moment in Toonami's history when they finally worked out a deal to get a Sentai show on the block for the first time when it was a Kami got kill and then very soon after parasite joined in uh yeah. i i really enjoyed a Kami got kill off paul has parasite on his top 10 of all time uh i think for correction, this generation like it's an it exclusive is, list for him well no 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 correction it is i have deemed parasite the best show yes best show on this version of tsunami since tsunami came back on yeah. adult swim Wow. So yes. I'm, I'm curious how how excited like you and your colleagues were the fact that a Sentai show was finally getting the chance to shine, be it both a Kamiga Kill and Parasite. And you were in both, you know, pretty, I would say like the most prominent, but pretty prominent characters that we could uh, easily recall when you think about it, especially like Dr. Stylish. Right. Uh, someone um, on, on Twitter, um, tweeted at me in the middle of uh, live tweeting, I think, uh, must have been Parasite, one of the best tweets I've ever seen. Uh, and it was, um, they set it up as a quote um, that it was clearly coming from me, like Jay Hickman, colon, I'm not always on Toonami, but when I do, I die. Um, <laughs> so, uh it was it was great about those characters they uh they they came in they definitely had an impact and then um were yeah met a met a grisly end um but yeah we were to your question uh thrilled i mean there there's there's no other no other word i think and it was not um you know i had not known that this was even kind of in the offing i, I didn't know that um you know it, as you alluded earlier, I, I'm I'm a mere voice actor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not uh, I'm not called into the meetings in the big boardroom very often. Um, so you know, I didn't know there were discussions. I didn't know that this was even kind of um, you know uh, a goal or a pipe dream. Um, but yeah, it was announced, and we had already um, 
we had already recorded a Kame Got Killed. And so uh, I knew the show and, you know, had really enjoyed being a part of that. Um, and then, yeah, it was just uh, just a delightful surprise when it was announced that it was going to to join the Toonami block. Uh, obviously, for anyone in the industry, that is, you know, kind of a kind of a holy grail. Um, just in terms of because, again, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, what what is really fulfilling for me and gratifying and being a part of this industry is the chance to be a part of creating something that is special for people and you know to to have a chance to have your audience uh expanded so broadly like you know being on toonami certainly would um was exciting it, it just opens up all of these um opportunities for for more people to enjoy something that you sunk you know all of this heart and energy into creating it's 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 the greatest what do you think made a parasite such a m memorable uh show like many and it's not just paul a ton a ton of toonami fans cannot stop talking about how just wonderful it was the parasite joined the blog why do you think that show really spoke to a lot of uh toonami fans compared to you know, others that have been around kind of thing? Um, because he gave me $20, the answer is Kyle Jones. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just, although um, absolutely, uh, what, what, Kyle, what Kyle brought to that project and making it what it is is, is undeniable. Um, but yeah, the... Again, I think this is another case of just so many ingredients that that were just right um, and combined in just the right way. But this the the show was obviously it was like nothing you've ever seen. You know, it was shocking. Um, the the concept was you know just um, both outlandish and you know played realistically enough to be terrifying like you know what if uh because i think you know too it, it, this is it was introduced in the um in the era of kind of uh zombie theater like everyone is completely engrossed with the idea of a zombie apocalypse to the to the point that you know while it is fiction uh people can't help but wonder well, what if mm -hmm. Like, and so, um, I think, you know, the way, the way the, the subject matter is treated in Parasite is, you know, it is, um, obviously not tongue in cheek. It doesn't take itself too seriously either. Um, and it's done in just a way to be like, that is truly, truly horrifying. Um, but also, you know, the, the, um, the, the characters work, I think, you know, you really want to root, um, you want to root for the protagonist in this one. I, I think in you know, there's just a right element of what's what's happening to him is terrifying, but also he's got some um, you know, he's got a couple uh, decent kind of uh, consolation prizes out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, his eyesight, for one, did you see? Yeah. Um, so you know, I think there's. The animation is superb. I think the score was great. Um, Gotta love that dubstep. Yeah, and <laughs> my, my um, myself excluded, the the, the performances uh, were dynamite. I just thought they were were so good, and obviously, you know, hand in hand with that, um, the direction um, you have to uh, you have to have a great director to draw out the very best performances, and so I, I think. You know, all of it, um, all of it just sort of came together um, in a way that made it really, uh, you know, really memorable and really watchable. Yeah, no, I, I will say uh, the director did a phenomenal job. I think it was a lot of uh, the best performances at the time for me when I when I first started, especially uh, Andrew Love's character. I thought that was his his best character he's ever done. It was so twisted, evil, and he did such a good job with it. He re he really did. Yeah, yeah. He is, that guy. That guy is superb. No question. <laughs> uh, 
but I, I will say, you know, it isn't just, you know, shows that are licensed by Sentai that you've got to be on. Uh, you were also got, got to be on probably the most popular anime on the planet right now in My Hero Academia. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, no, we, we do our homework. We make sure we double. Uh, it seems like everyone is kind of treating My Hero like the Dragon Ball, where it's like they can't wait to get that call to be like, hey, do you want to audition and see if you might be in a role for this? So what, was, what was it like getting to be a part of that uh, project now? That was... Um uh in a word fantastic but um <laughs> to to give you a little more subtext um yeah that was um that was a, a really fun one and it was it was interesting because i had um i've been on i've been on my hero before season four um you might not know that you may not have done quite enough homework <laughs> i I went, um, I did some Walla for them in a previous season. And to be completely honest, I haven't done my homework either. I do not know the season or the episode. It felt like it felt based on what I saw of the recording session, it was like there was some sort of graduation ceremony going on. Um, and for some reason, uh, some bad guys decided to show up in the middle of graduation when all the heroes would be collected in one place. It was not a smart move on their part. So I, um, I was I was at Funimation recording something else with Mike McFarland, and he's like, "While you're here, um, would you like to duck into a Walla session with Colleen um, for the show she's working on?" I'm like, "Yeah, absolutely." And so um, I did not know the show at the time. Um, I walked in, met Colleen. She's lovely as can be. Uh, she introduced me to the show, told me what's happening. Basically, uh, there wasn't, you know, a lot of, uh, kind of background I needed to, you know, have, um, be prepared to give her, you know, some good stuff. So, you know, these are, I, I was in like a trio of ninjas or bad guys or something who show up. They have a few lines, they get beat up real bad and then it's, it's over. Um, and so um, I got to, you know, see it and it looked cool. And I learned, obviously learned about, I knew about the show then. And so after that, in, you know, the year or so that passed, um, I definitely had an awareness of the show and how it was remarkably popular and how, how much people were really invested in, you know, what was going on with that story and the characters. Um, and so, um, when I got called to come in um, for season four, um, I did not know what exactly was happening. Uh, I didn't know what the character was. Um, and I think um, they, I think they gave me a code name for who the character was um, just to keep, keep everything under wraps. Um, and so I knew how long my session was going to be and it was long enough for me to think like, well, something's happening, but I don't, I don't know exactly what is happening. So there was, there was some sense of excitement and anticipation there um, going in to kind of find out uh, what, uh, what they had in store for me. And so I walk in um, and um Colleen comes in the waiting room. She extends her hand. She's like, I'm Colleen. Nice to meet you. I'm like, actually. Um, so we, we had a laugh over that. Uh, she did not remember the Wallace session either. <laughs> um, I barely remember. I, I still, I still, I wouldn't be able to point you to where it was, but I hope maybe somebody can help me track that down. Um, and so she, uh, yeah, walked me into the studio. We talked all through it. She told me, who the character was and she, you know, did such a great job of setting it up um, because she was genuinely excited for, for this guy, uh, Taneo and the, the role he would play in the story. Um, and she, you know, we talked about exposition before. So she's like, at the beginning of every season, there has to be an exposition episode so that people who are joining for the first time can get caught up and hopefully they do it in a way 
that doesn't cause eye rolls among the diehard fans. And she's like, I'm really, really excited about the, the con, the conceit they used this time around to do it, to have a reporter kind of introduce what's happening in the story and who these characters are. And, um, so she was like, I, you know, I'm excited, um, for that and excited that, you know, you're, you're able to do it, uh, and, and do it justice. And, you know, I saw what she meant. Like it was a really clever way, um, for them to do it. And so she was like, as far as I know, like he, he goes, he rides off into the sunset. Um, but hopefully he'll be back. Maybe, uh, you know, um, there's no reason why not because you, you know, for, for those that saw that particular episode and I guess, I guess I should be careful in case some people are behind by, uh, by half a season, but, um, you know, he, uh, we're not sure, quite sure about him at the beginning. Uh, not quite sure what he's up to, what his motives are. And it, it turns out in the end, he's, he seems to be a good guy. So hopefully they'll have him back. I, I like that's what they did with that too. And I, I, I thought your performance of that was really, really convincing. You know, like you, it really felt like if that character was to life, you would have your voice. If you, if you know what I mean, like, uh, when sure. it comes to listening to that, like, I thought you were able to play the character. Like, like you say, it's, just, you know, so far it's just one episode. Who knows what happened? But it really, I think, I think he does have a memorable impact, whether, you know, with it just because like it's yet another person who's kind of kind of more on Midoriya's side and able to kind of see more than what others kind of see I guess in a way yeah yeah and I think you know too the you, you get to see that he's got a genuine um a real life backstory uh and they you know they don't spend a lot of time on it but they don't need to um you know about how he feels about All Might and why that is and um so, you know, you, you do feel as you're learning about that, like you, I think for people that love the show and love All Mind and love, um, you know, kind of the world that was created because All Might's around, um, I, I think they can, they can feel like they have a, a connection to this character too, who genuinely, uh, may feel the same way they do. <laughs> no, then, like I say, I, I think. A lot of people would say you did a phenomenal job uh, being part Thank of that. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, it was, it and, he, and he loves meat buns. And what's more relatable than that? Hey, I mean, first you have a character who makes them, then you have one who likes to eat them. So, I mean, <laughs> it's like full circle here. There you go. Um, I will say one show that, uh, kind of close to wrap this up, but there is one show that I'm a huge fan of that I would have loved to have been on Toonami, and maybe there's a chance with, a new season being announced with Log Horizon. I, I am a huge fan of it. I, first of all, the theme song is top tier, god tier. It's awesome. But I'm curious yeah. how how you felt about being a part of the project and and now at least learning that there could potentially be more stuff for Sentai Filmworks to work with it. If you know, you never know what could happen. But just the prospect right. of it being of it being a possibility, kind of thing. Yeah. I hate to sound like a broken record, but I loved it. Like I, there, you know, there, there are not a lot of shows that I get to be a part of that I don't genuinely, truly enjoy. And, you know, I, I think as my, um, you know, my career has gone on, you know, I'm, I'm getting to be a part of these shows in, um, you know, juicy roles and, you know, something that, that sort of matters to the story. Not all the time. I mean, I, you know, I come in to play a bit part. I'm just as happy to do that to mm -hmm. um, what, whatever kind of whatever I can lend to the project. I'm glad to lend that. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't insist on being, uh, you know, being an integral, um, integral uh, character every single time. But uh, I do find that, you know, I'm, I'm getting the chance more and more often to, to do something like that. And it's so, um, you know, again, overuse the word gratifying. It truly is. Uh, you know, it's exciting too. And so, um, this, uh, this character, Krusty, I, you know, he, um, I definitely, I definitely saw a lot of myself in him. Um, I think he's, uh, you know, I wear spectacles. I, I try to rock them and make them, you know, important part of, uh, my persona. Uh, he's quite, uh, he's quite snarky um decent with the ladies <laughs> um, 
and you know a gamer who suddenly is you know thrust into this world and um you know there there was lot lots kind of relatable about the character in the show that um I really enjoyed being a part of it um you know as much as uh, as watching it you know the story is fun um and so he I think this will be no surprise to you guys. I, I think there was a lot of kind of um, sort of curiosity among among the audience for the show about, you know, where did Krusty go and mm-hmm. why, what season two seemed to end abruptly and what's going on and is there going to get a season three? Like that has almost definitely been for me um, the number one question about shows related to like, when is this coming back or are there plans for, another part of this um you know I, I get questions about that for some other shows but nothing like this one uh and so to hear that announcement was um yeah very exciting indeed and i think too you know if if um if there is a season three and it gets the full uh treatment um english uh, english dub and all that stuff i think you know possibly uh having a longer tailed thing like that could make it more attractive um for for tsunami um you guys would know as well as anyone kind of you know the kind of uh shows they seem attracted to but it it does look like if if a show's got longer legs more seasons it may be more worthwhile to trot it out um so that if it goes well then it can stay on you know yeah and the subject matter fits considering other types of shows where people are trapped in games, you know, as a dot hack SAO, just as recent examples. So I, I certainly couldn't see why they wouldn't look at it. Yeah. And I think it's, it's novel enough in, in its treatment of that kind of concept um, that it wouldn't be, you know, um, too hackneyed for people. I, I, I think it's, yeah. it's got, it brings a fresh, a fresh perspective to that uh, kind of sub genre uh, that people would find exciting. Yeah. And I'd love to see the villain in glasses get a chance to shine. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, Jay, we can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk with us. Uh, before we let you go, is there something you'd like to like plug, tell people to check out that you, of course, can talk about? <laughs> uh, sure. Of course. Of course. Of course. Um, uh, so thank you, too. This has been a lot of fun. A uh, real pleasure. And, um, yeah, I think... Um, uh, new show um, out with Sentai, a hero no Sora. Um, you, it's the basketball show. Like this is um, this is something I've been able to uh, to be a part of. It's another uh, uh, another Kyle Jones flick. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a great it's a great little show. Um, it's kind of uh, for those that don't know it, it's uh, some kind of high school reprobates who all they really have is basketball and kind of their ragtag group and troublemakers. And, um, they, uh, they actually have some talent and a whole lot of heart and it looks like, uh, they just might be able to make this thing work. Uh, and so I play one of the, um, I guess he's the, he's introduced as the school disciplinarian who is kind of assigned to be the, uh, not the coach, um, what's the word sort of the kind of chaperone for yeah. the kids to kind of keep, keep them in line. Uh, he ends up getting thrust into a, a coach role, which is ill fitting and hilarious for him, but um, uh, fun show. So that's, uh, that's out now available on high streaming on high dive. So I would, I would love people to give that a look. And then um, uh, a couple of shows um, that I've been a part of that are on Netflix now, like that's exciting too. kind of, in the kind of realm of getting a show on Toonami to have it be on Netflix, just where anybody can watch it now. There's such a broad audience. Um, so there's uh, many people may be aware of uh, Saint Seiya. It is being yep. reintroduced for the Netflix audience. Uh, and so I've been able to um, you know, have some involvement in that, which has been exciting uh, for me, given my involvement in the original um English dub from a long time ago, a long time ago now. Um, so I'm really excited to see that one come back because that that show holds a special place in my heart. Um, 
and for people that enjoy, you know, the genre of of uh, fighting lads, um, where where a fight can take an entire episode. Uh, if they haven't seen Saint Say yet, they might give it a give it a tumble. It's it's uh, it's quite a lot of fun. That's awesome. Um, and again, Jay, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. I didn't mean to take too much of your time, but it was just such a great conversation. I just didn't want you to stop, really. I didn't want to stop either. Let's uh, let's do it again sometime. It was yeah. a pleasure for me. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. No. Again, thank you, thank you so much. I hope everyone enjoyed listening, and I hope it wasn't too too many hard questions for you. That's always the goal. Not not hard questions. I'm uh, I'm not sweating yet. <laughs> I'll have to try harder next time. All right, but but thank you, and thank you to everyone for listening in. You bet. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Paul. We'll uh, we'll see you on the flip side. See you.